All right, so we're continuing from where we left off in Pirkei Avot, Perek Shishi. We're about to learn, I believe, the longest Mishnah of all. Even though it's actually divided up into several Mishnayot, it is a very different type of Mishnah. It actually prescribes to us the way of, a, of achieving Torah, how one goes about achieving Torah, step by step. But before we begin to see the steps that are required to achieve Torah, to achieve the greatness, the higher levels of Torah, the Mishnah reminds us of the importance of Torah in comparison to other crowns. As we've learned before, there are three crowns. The Jewish nation received three crowns, the crown of priesthood, the crown of royalty, and the crown of Torah. The priesthood, the crown of priesthood is an important crown. We're dealing with a group of people, an entire tribe basically, that is dedicated to the service of God. And as a result of that, there's an arrangement between them and us, the rest of Am Yisrael, that we provide for them, that we assist them in other areas, so they can devote their time to learning, to teaching, and to being involved in all the service of the Bet HaMikdash during the time that we had the, the Bet HaMikdash. So that is considered the crown because it, it is a high level. It is a high position. And it is accorded to a group of people that HaKadosh Baruch Hu decided who they will be. He chose Shevet Levi. And today Shevet Levi is divided into Kohanim and Leviim. The two of them, however, are intertwined. They're both involved in different capacities in doing the Avodat HaKodesh, the holy work. Holy work needs to be done by certain people. There is a great deal of people who will be involved in agriculture, in industry today, in, uh, in business. Who's going to take care of the Avodat HaKodesh? Who's going to be responsible for the, the more important job? And that is the job that deals with our relationship with God. Even though we all pray, we all need to learn, not everybody has the time to learn eight hours a day, ten hours a day. People have different abilities. People have different jobs and functions. So the Keter Kehuna is considered the Keter not only because of the importance of the position, but we, ourselves, we, those of us who are not Kohanim, should also look up to it as being something important and not look down at it that, oh, these people are living off our hard work. No, we, we support them because we know how important this is for the entire nation. It is a crown, therefore, for us to look up to. It is definitely a high position that deserves our respect. And, of course, the Torah describes on how they needed to dress, a special dress code, which, of course, was the chavod ulitifara, to bring kavod honor to their position. So they themselves should always constantly be reminded of the importance of their job, not to take it lightly. They themselves need to know, you are Kohanim. You are chosen for a specific job, and it's not an ordinary job. It's Avodat HaKodesh, a holy job. So that is one crown. Then we have the crown of Malchut, the crown of royalty, which is also important. He is a leader, he is a king, he has tremendous responsibilities in leading the nation. He has to have certain qualifications. Can't just be anybody. But the more specific limitation of who a king can be is Mizar Oshel David. It has to be from the seed of David. Shevet Yehuda, the tribe of Yehuda. Other than that, obviously, you know, he, he needs to be a God-fearing individual. It is a Keter as well. A crown that we need to look up to. I mean, if people don't look up to, he has no power. If people do not accept him, you know, he won't be as successful. In order for him to succeed, you know, obviously he has to follow the Torah, and the Jewish people have to accept his word. Even though the Torah makes it very clear to us that we have no need to have a king like other nations have chosen to have monarchs and kings. We can lead our lives through prophets and the rabbis and, and receive direct messages from Hashem if we were on that level. But if we chose to, 
there are certain rules that need to be followed in order to have a king. So this position, the position of royalty, is also a very high position. It's called a Keter Malchut. Nonetheless, it's not necessarily the highest position of all, as we will soon see. Keter Torah is a crown which is above all of them. Keter Torah is a crown, as the Rabbim says, that is achievable for every Jew. Any Jew can put it on. Any Jew can acquire it. You don't have to be born into a certain family. And that's very, very good to know because you know, here we are told, well, you can't be a Kohen if you're not a Kohen. If your father's not a Kohen, you can't be a Levi if your father was not a Levi. But you can put on the Keter of Torah because it belongs to all of us. We did learn, however, in Perek Levi, in the fourth chapter, that there's one crown that is above all these crowns, including Keter Torah. And you may wonder which one it is. Well, it's the Keter Shem Tov. It's the Keter, the crown of a good name, a good reputation, which obviously is the crown that you fashion yourself. A person, throughout his life, but when he works on his midot, on his character, refining them, working on his uh, deficiencies and his weaknesses, uh, hopefully strengthens himself in such a way where he finds favor in the eyes of God and man. Right? Mitziat Chen, whether it's before Hashem or whether it's before man, the two are important. Bnei Lokim Ve'adam, as it says. That is something that everyone should strive for. It's also achievable, and it's actually part of what we need to do. Keta Torah, however, even though I just finished saying it is something that is accessible to all, if we look at the reality, we, all, we, we can only be realistic, the vast majority will not have the full extent of the Torah on their head, the full crown, because the reality is that they will be in business, they will be involved in some other uh, capacity, where they will not simply have the time to devote for Torah as others. There, there are rabbis, there are judges, there are various individuals uh, who will be much more immersed in Torah, who p possibly uh, acquired the crown of Torah. But the Keter Shem Tov, the, the crown of a good name, that is possible for everyone to acquire, and that is actually uh, inexcusable. That is something that nobody can say, I wasn't smart enough, I didn't have enough time for it. What kind of an excuse are, is one going to find for not having a good name? You know? Obviously, if one realizes the importance of it and goes about it and is careful with not earning himself a bad name, then hopefully he'll have a good name. It's not easy, obviously. One has to work on it. But it's definitely a, a very lofty crown, and it is a crown that everyone can wear. But here we're not talking about the Keter Shem Tov, we're more specifically talking about the Keter of Torah. After all, this whole Perek, the Perek Shishi, the sixth Perek, deals with the importance of Torah, the acquisition of Torah, the value of Torah. It is a very important Perek simply because not everybody realizes the importance of Torah. If people really value Torah properly, they would never think of sending their kid to a public school. I mean, public school is not only dangerous to the soul of the Jew because of the potential of assimilation. All the knowledge that can be acquired in a, in a good, proper Jewish school will be wasted. In other words, it will not be acquired by this child who's going to a public school where they don't teach it. So even though he remains an angel, and he's a good kid, and he has a good family, he will be completely, completely ignorant and you may, of Torah, even though he later may pick it up a little bit. What a waste. Four, five, six years, depending if it was elementary or high school, of not spending in a Jewish school because it was too expensive. Well, why did you want buy yourself a Lexus? You could have used that money for Jewish education instead. The priorities are very messed up by a lot of people. Therefore, we need this perek, this perek, in order to impress upon Jews that this is something that our forefathers sacrificed for. Mothers used to sell their jewelry 
if they didn't have enough money to pay for the tuition. There were mothers who sold their candelabras, their silver candelabras, and you know how they lit for the next couple of weeks the Shabbat candles? They took two potatoes, and that's where they used them for their candle wicks, for the candlesticks. You see from many, many stories of the past that the Jews were prepared to sacrifice because they knew the value of Torah, they knew the value of mitzvot. So this, we're talking about the crown of Torah. We're not just talking about observance of mitzvot, which is important, obviously. Here we're talking about the proper value of Torah in those that possess the Torah. Rabbis go to the extent of telling us, Be careful with the children of the poor. Why be careful with their children? Because if they come to you and you're a principal of a school and you charge them and you demand a certain amount of money which they don't have, you may be committing a tremendous transgression because the rabbis tell us that we have a tradition that Ki mehem Torah from the simple folks, from the poor people amongst us, that is where the biggest and greatest giants of Torah will come from. One should not think just because he's learned and he's a rabbi, his children and his grandchildren automatically will be so as well. No. On the contrary, Hashem wants to show that Torah can come from anywhere. So one should not say, well, if my father was, I will be. No, you have to work hard on it on your own. And one should not say the other way around. If my father was not, who am I to be one? No. We have great examples, living examples today of such individuals. Hacham Ovadia Yosef, as all of you probably know, He's a leader, he's a tremendous Tamil Chacham and Posek. And he came from a parents who were very simple, average. And he almost was going to end up in Shuk Mahne Yehuda, in the marketplace selling fruits and vegetables. Yeah, almost, it had it not been for his, one of his rabbis and teachers that convinced the father, you need help? I'll come to help you, the rabbi said. I'll come, but your son sent him to the yeshiva. Obviously, the, rabbi, the, the father gave up, and gave his son a chance, and the, chan, and the son, of course, turned out to be a tremendous uh, chacham. With time, he blossomed, and uh, Baruch Hashem, he's contributed so much by way of his shiurim, his books, to Am Yisrael. So the light of Torah will come from even the simplest families that we, we, we never have thought of it. Obviously, it must also be some zechut, some merit that the father and mother have, that they have such a neshama, they brought such a soul into the world. You don't just bring it, such a beautiful soul just like that. It has to be that the, the couple must have been clean, must have been pure, could have been very charitable, could have had some other zechut, some merit, in order to deserve a higher neshama, which is also important. The neshama has to be obviously a, a pure neshama in order to be able to absorb the Torah and to grow with it. So therefore, we are constantly being reminded that this Torah is something that we should all aspire for. This is what we should strive for. This is what we should pray for, that our kids should be great in Torah. Because Parnassad, livelihood, oh, that he should be an engineer, <laughs> that he should be an architect, he should be the best doctor. That depends on his mazal. That is pure mazal. People don't understand that. No matter how many years you go to college, no matter how good of a grade you get, it is not a guarantee that the parnasa will be there, the livelihood. As the rabbis tell us, they are poor and rich in every trade, in every profession. Yeah, even poor lawyers, Baruch Hashem. <laughs> yeah, right? So, what does it have to do with it? It has to do with mazal. It all depends on their mazal. If a person has a good mazal, he can be illiterate. He may not even know one word of English. He just arrived from Ahvaz, <laughs> if you know what that is. <laughs> and he doesn't know a word of English, and just somehow everything he touches turns to gold. Yeah, what's that? It's called mazal. You can have a guy who's a PhD. He's so smart, right? He got A pluses in everything. PhD, and he's having a hard time. He's not being hired. You know what the latest excuse is for people who are very smart? 
and knowledgeable, not to be hired, they say you're overqualified. They're trying to be nice to you. You're overqualified for this job. <laughs> overqualified, what's wrong with that? You're overqualified. It's all Mishamayim. It's only Mishamayim. Mazal. It's called Mazal. No matter what you do, it's very difficult to change. It's possible to change, but it, that's the Mazal. Torah? How much Torah do you learn? How many Prakim? How many Mishnayot? How many Pesukim? How much Parshiyot? How many Halachot? That's up to us. You can learn as much as you want. You can review it, know it. That's up to us. Nobody's going to stop us. Except, of course, work. But we do our best. So that is why Keter Torah, as we will see, is in many ways greater than the other Ketarim. Except for, of course, the Keter Shem Tov. <coughs> so now we're going to begin to see 48. It's going to take us two weeks to do it. 48 Ma'alot. 48 steps. 48 prerequisites and levels that need to, one needs to go through in order to achieve or in order to acquire the crown of Torah. So first the Mishnah begins with G'dolah Torah yotem mina keunah mina malchut shah malchut niknet b'shloshim ma'alot. The Torah is greater than the crown of priesthood and royalty because royalty is only acquired with 30 ma'alot, and I'll explain that in a moment, 30 levels or 30 uh, you can call it benefits to us. I will explain. There's two ways of understanding what ma'alot means. It is acquired or it is gotten by way of 30 steps, you may say, even though by malchut it's not steps, but 30, let's call them uh, benefits. And the keunah priesthood has 24. The Torah niknet barvayim ushmonat dvarim. And the Torah is acquired through 48 things. So you automatically see that there's some difference between Torah, that it says things, it doesn't even say ma'alot, and the other two that it says ma'alot. So what is really ma'alot? The word ma'alot by itself literally means yitronot, as we say it in Hebrew, advantages. But some of these advantages are also benefits. So that's why I said benefits too. So for example, matnot kehuna. When we're dealing with kehuna priesthood, we know there's something called the matnot, the, the priestly gifts that we would give the Kohanim, truma, right, trumat maaser, the bikurim. There's a whole list of matnot kehuna, the Kohanim and the Levim too, receive certain matanot, there's certain rights. And that is why you can call it certain benefits or ma'alot that the kehuna has. So the kehuna has 24 of them. I'm not going to list what they are right now. But there are 24 benefits that the kohanim have. Others, however, interpret ma'alot over here saying that it's not only about benefits. Kehuna is also about requirements or conditions, I should say limitations even, that kohanim, because of their higher level, in Am Yisrael, they have certain ma'alot, certain advantages, and as a result of those advantages or virtues, they are limited in who they can marry. They are especially limited from becoming tameh. They have to be more sensitive to impurities. So they, this kehuna is acquired with 24 ma'alot means that in order to be there, you have to be aware that you have these 24 gifts or benefits, plus you have 24 areas or 24 uh, ma'alot where you are different and where you are limited as a result of your higher level. Keunah is a higher level. So therefore in Keunah we can call the ma'alot either benefits that they get or higher levels, which of course bring about certain limitations. With a king, we said, Here too, you have different ways of looking at it. One is 
of the advantages that a king has, he's allowed to marry more women than an ordinary average Jew. During the time you were allowed to have more than one, you can have up to four, as long as you had enough credit cards, right? <laughs> to support everyone, you know, if you could really support that many, okay, go ahead. And of course, after a while, it started becoming very noisy in the house and <laughs> too much disputes between the wives, too many problems. So about a thousand years ago, Rabbi Nugitsham says, enough, let us hope you succeed with one. <laughs> Four, forget about it. So today, we don't have more than one. And, uh, and let us hope that everybody should succeed with their one Amen. at one time, at any given time. Even though there are some communities that allow you still to take more than one. Yeah. For that, you have to travel to Qom. <laughs> yeah. And a few other cities where maybe they'll allow you. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. That's marriage. A king had, was able to have 18. Wow. Yeah, some say more. But anyway, the king has certain privileges. So we can call his ma'alot not only advantages, certain privileges. But there's a reason why I'm saying both. Advantages means that he was able to have certain assets, certain things more than everybody else. The treasure, the military, the soldiers, the servants, everything. These are the benefits, that, and 30, they're listed. 30 ma'alot where he has certain privileges plus certain advantages. Ma'alot are also advantages because as a result of his high stature, nobody can see him take a haircut. Nobody's allowed to see him take bathe by himself. In other words, in order to elevate his status, in order to give him the proper kavod, respect, the king had these privileges or these advantages where he was not to testify, even though he's a witness, and they were not to judge him like they would judge an ordinary person, another an ordinary Jew. He qualified for a different kind of treatment. So if you were to count the privileges, advantages that the Malchut had, you would find about 30 where he stands out uh, above everyone else. So we have 30 for Malchut, we have 24 for Kehuna where they where both have certain ma'alot. However, ha-Torah niknet ba-arba'im u-shmona dvarim. The Torah has 48, but these 48 are not advantages, they're not benefits or privileges. Here there are 48 devarim. Here the emphasis is on actually going up step by step. These are devarim through which, if you do them, you acquire Torah. So these are, I call them prerequisites. Prerequisites to acquire Torah, and what kind of Torah? We're talking about, of course, Torah Lishma, the, the purest Torah that is possible. In order to acquire the crown of Torah properly, one needs to go through all these 48. So this is an incredible list that, you know, people just rush through it if they learn it. They don't realize how important each one of it is. And once you learn them, the 48, and we'll go through about, about half of them today, briefly, you will see how, how true it is, how valuable each one of them is, and how without it, one could be missing so much. So in order to be able to grow in Torah, in order to, to, to be able to acquire the crown, crown meaning that, that we are crowned by something, we have been elevated to the status of being a true ben Torah, of being a vessel, where the Torah will reside with us and, and feel comfortable with us, and where we can learn and grasp and understand and enjoy and, and connect to Hashem in the most powerful way through the medium called Torah, it is imperative. It, it's, it's, it's very, very important that one go through all these 48. Otherwise, it's, it's not possible. So let's begin to see what those 48 are. By the way, the reason why he calls them dvarim, not only are they prerequisites, is because we will see that these ma'alot, or these dvarim, require constancy. They require tremendous investment and hard work. It's, you know, it's, try going up a steep mountain. Even if there are steps, it becomes very, very difficult, tiring. 
try to go up a building, you know, if the elevator is not working, Empire State Building. You know, after a while you get tired, even though there are steps. So that's what's required. You know, it requires hard work and commitment, investment, until one is able to transform himself to a vessel of Torah, because that's what this will do. This will transform the Jew. It's not just, here, this is a prerequisite, then we'll give you the crown. No, this actually transforms the individual, and that is why he becomes a very good uh, vessel through which the Torah can, uh, I guess, conduct itself. How do, you, how do you call it, you know, when you have certain wires that are... Con conduits. Like conduits, you know? Like okay. copper is a good conduit. Is that what it is? A conduit. So in order for him to be a good conduit through which the Torah can flow, he needs to devote himself completely to it. Can you say channel it? Also, you can say channel can it. Say yeah, yes, you can so. say that, yeah. So what are the 48 things or prerequisites? Number one, the Talmud. Talmud, that's the easy one. We, everybody knows. What does Talmud mean? To learn. <laughs> to learn. I mean, how are you going to get Torah without learning? The word Talmud is not just to learn. The word Talmud reminds us that there is no kitsure derech. There are no shortcuts. Why would I think there is a shortcut? Well, if right now you want to learn Russian, you want to learn a foreign language, you want to learn Turkish, you want to learn Korean, whatever it is, there are shortcuts. Yeah, yeah. Today's shortcuts of learning a language without being in the country is by listening to tapes. You listen, you listen a hundred times to the guy saying what he's saying till you acquire the accent and till little by little you memorize the words. And that is how a child picks up a language too. He hears, he hears, he hears, and he starts talking. Right? So, Torah is not learning a foreign language. Torah, there's no shortcuts. It's not just to hear what everything is being said. It, it requires learning, figuring out, understanding it, discussing it. That's what Talmud means. Talmud is not just, let me hear the class, let me hear a lecture, and even though obviously somebody, you will learn certain things from that too, but that's not enough. It requires Talmud to learn it, to discuss it, to look into it deeper. That's number, number one. And in order to, for, for, for someone to actually learn it well, he, he at some point will require a teacher, a rabbi, a, a companion to learn with, because it requires further understanding, not just the literary meaning of the text, now what? What about in this kind of a situation? What happens if this ha takes place? There's so many theoretical situations that we want to know what the answer to them is. That requires Talmud to continuously learn. When you learn Gemara, you get a little bit of a feel of what Talmud is because you see the analysis of the rabbis breaking up into small parts and details a pasuk or a halakha, where do we learn it from, where do we derive it from? How do you know it's like this? Doesn't this contradict some other principle? This is Talmud. That's why it's called Talmud, the Gemara. The whole discussion of how do we arrive at this halakha, how do we know it from? Moshe Rabbeinu said it, yes. Where did he say it? Which pasuk? Where do you see it in the pasuk? Which word says it? This word? But this word is being used to teach us another halakha already. You can't use it for the tool. See what I mean? That's the way the discussion becomes more intricate, more interesting. Okay. And sometimes you have more than one opinion. That's Talmud. The next prerequisite is Bishmiat Haozin. Bishmiat Haozin? Obviously, you have to hear. What does Shmiyat Ozen mean with listening of the ear? Well, you can't listen through any other organ. What Shmiyat Ozen means is it's not enough to lehazin or lishmoa. It has to be to absorb. It has to be liklot et advarim. It has to be with the intent of actually understanding what I heard. A lot of people hear things. Does that mean they remember it? Does it mean they absorbed it? It came in in one ear, it went out the other ear. That's what al or al means. With clarity, thoroughly, the details. So a person wants to learn, a person wants to know it well. He doesn't just want, not just on the surface, 
Learning requires, therefore, Shmi'at Ha'ozim to be able to absorb it properly. The next one, before we go to the next one, it happens many, many times that people hear the Shi'ur, they hear the Halachot, they learn Torah, and they're listening. But there's too much distraction. Hesechadat. Too much distraction kills or spoils the whole thing. Sometimes you need a lot of concentration, depending on the subject matter. Some, of course, some topics are easier, and there's, you, you don't need that much concentration. But some require tremendous amounts of concentration, otherwise you can't figure it out. Otherwise, it's hard to remember all the details. Arichat Sefatayim. Arrangement of the lips. That's what the words mean. What does it mean to arrange the lips? It is a very not a good idea for a person to learn Torah quietly to himself without saying the words out loud. The Gemara brings two incidents that I recall now. One of where a student learned Torah quietly without repeating it, without uttering it. And after three years, he forgot everything he learned. Part of memorization, one of the techniques of remembering what you learn is to say it to say it out loud. When you're learning at home, you're learning anywhere, say it out loud. Don't just read it quietly as though you're reading some novel or some other book that you can afford to forget. Torah, you don't want to forget. As it is, we're forgetful. That is, is we need to review several times so we not forget. But without arichat sefatayim, without saying it, there's a chance that with, with, with perhaps a couple of years, Whatever we learned, we will forget. There was another incident where Bruria, famous woman in the time of the Gemara, she was a very knowledgeable woman. She once went over to a Talmud Chacham, a young scholar who was learning quietly, and she gave him a kick. She says, what are you doing to yourself? You're learning quietly, you're going to forget all your learning. So she gave him Musar. She rebuked him. She says, that's not the way to learn. And she proved it to him, where it says in the Basuk, that it has, in order for you to preserve your learning, you have to have it, you have to express it, you have to say it clearly, otherwise you will forget it. So Arichat Sefatayim is another prerequisite to learn and to remember to know Torah. Without it, we will forget. All the hard work will go to waste. Next one is Bebinat Halev. Binat Halev means with the understanding of the heart. Understanding of the heart, that's a little bit hard to understand. What does it mean with understanding of the heart? It has to sit well. It has to uh, be understood. It has to not just be heard. It's not enough that we hear what the words are being said. It has to make sense to us. We have to feel at ease with it. If we're troubled wise, if we still have some issues with it, we have to ask. Otherwise, you heard it, you said it, but you didn't fully understand and grasp it. That also won't count too much, won't go too, uh, too far. Binat Halev, therefore, is, an, is something that we need to make an effort. This is very typical of many, many situations where people are very nice. They're attentive, attentive. But they don't always understand what is being said. Ask. Otherwise, that's very nice that you came. You got the reward for the learning of Torah. You got the reward for being attentive and listening. Oh, of course. And maybe a couple of halachot will be remembered. But without binat alev, without making sure that you understand everything, then there's, there's a chance that a great deal will be lost. So binat alev means an effort is required, especially students in school who are thinking about their basketball thinking about sports, thinking about their, their, their homework, thinking about all kinds of things during the time that they're learning. There's, no, there's not going to be enough binat halev to absorb what the Rebbe is teaching. So the, all, the entire year can go by and maybe a fraction of what was taught they remember, they recall. That has to do with a lack of binat halev. They didn't... Uh, there's a special word for it in English. They didn't put their heart to it. They didn't make up their mind that they're going to understand it. They're not going to go on to the next page before they know this page well. It requires a certain amount of, of uh, 
of assertiveness. You know, I, I want to know this. Not just, oh, nice. Don't, the kid doesn't make any trouble. He's attentive. He knows a little bit what's going God, Not at all. But don't you want to understand it and fully appreciate it? That's called binata live. Full understanding. Otherwise, you learned it. Yeah, but what did you, what, what, what remained with you? The next one is Besichlut Alev, some add Besichlut Alev, even though really Binat Alev, Besichlut Alev is the same, it's pretty much the same idea. In other words, that a person is intelligent enough to be able to delve into it deeper, to be able to figure out what it's saying. Uh, so Binat Alev, Besichlut Alev are very similar. I think therefore some leave out Besichlut Alev. It means proper understanding or deeper understanding of what is being taught. The next two are extremely important. Be'ima be'yir'a. Uh, many people don't know the difference between them. Ema is awe, A-W-E. Yir'a is fear. Does anybody here know the difference between awe and fear? Awe is reverence. Awe has a component of reverence in it. And it's used for God. We don't, we're not afraid. We have awe and reverence from Him. It's a much higher level of fear. You know? Who do you fear? A wild animal. You don't want to be, get, you don't want to be bitten. Right? You, feel a, or you fear a criminal. You fear a, a bomb. Right? That's called Eima. Eima is awe and reverence for who? For God. It better be there. In Yira, not Pahad, it says Yira. Yira is one level above Pahad, is the regular, what we call fear or scare. Yira is also a certain level of respect in our fear. We fear someone because we respect him. Otherwise, if he would be a regular human being, we wouldn't have fear for him. This, the yira is of the teacher, of the rabbi. If there is no awe, reverence from God, no fear and respect for the teacher, the attitude will not be good. What does it mean the attitude will not be good? When, when there is fear and awe, there is fear of making a mistake. Oh no, I better know it right. I want to know the halakha because I, I want to do it right. And this is the halakha, this is the Torah. I can't make a mistake. If it's with the teacher, and he has no respect or fear for the teacher, he'll take the whole class lightly. He won't take it seriously. Torah requires a serious attitude, seriousness. And not every child has that. Not every child is serious. A lot of clowns out there, clowning around. <laughs> and they're not going to be having the crown of Torah on them. It's not, it's not compatible. It's just not, it won't work. People who are clowns, and there are people like that, I'm sure you know them, of them. They're not going to learn too much Torah. They don't take it seriously, they take it very lightly, they look down at teachers or rabbis. They're very far from it. Not only are they far from Torah, they're even far from observance of certain mitzvot and from teshuvah. How is a person going to do teshuvah if he mocks and makes fun of Torah, of the teachers, he looks down at them, you see? And they say all kinds of things. So it requires a certain level of Eima and Yira. And Eima, of course, means from Hashem. A Jew who is a, who's a, who's a genius, he's smart, very, very smart, who has no Eima, he can learn and not be impressed by the Torah. He's going to say, well, the Jews must have had a very smart committee who put this together. He can reach that kind of a conclusion if he has no aim of God. He may be religious, he may be observant, he may believe in God, he, he, he has emunah, but still be lacking in aim and not take it too seriously. He says, yeah, he says, you only live once, you've got to enjoy life too, you know, come on. You know, a few minutes a day is enough. He doesn't have enough aim of realizing how important this is. So Imar is an attitude. Imar in your eyes is having the right attitude of proper respect, proper fear, proper awe for Hashem, 
Otherwise, you know, he won't be able to accept all that he's learning as this is real. This is the fact. You know, there are people who are not so serious, and if they don't understand something, they don't want to do it. Somebody who has the eye says, I don't understand it. I wish one day I will understand it, but I'm going to do it because this is Hashem's will for me to do. Whenever somebody asks you the following question, why can't I have zebra meat? She's such a, such a cute animal. Zebras. What's wrong? What's the answer? Well, it's not a kosher animal. Yeah, but what's wrong with it? The zebra is not even a carnivore. I can understand carnivore. You are what you eat. And, you know, if the animal were to eat all kinds of things and you become like it, you know, this guy is a logical guy. But what's wrong with a zebra? Oh, no, I'm not going to eat rats. Oh, no. I'm not going to eat. But what's wrong with zebra? What would you tell him? It's not a kosher animal. It's not a clean animal. But why? What makes it a non-kosher animal? Even though you can go into a very deep discussion, Kabbalistic discussion, and try to explain the difference between the clean and unclean animals, it may not be sufficient to convince the guy. He wants something that will convince him logically, and there's no logic to this. That is why the best answer when dealing with difficult questions, such as kashrut, the best answer is, you know why I can't eat it? Because God said so. And that's enough for me. Why isn't that enough for you? It may be that you don't believe in Him. If you believe in God, then what's wrong with just accepting what He said? Don't you accept what your doctor tells you? Yeah. In the morning at 10 o'clock, you take one aspirin. At 4 o'clock, you take the second one. But why, doctor? Can I just skip a day? <laughs> Not if you want to get better. Right? You listen to Him. Just because He has a white gown, maybe He got a D in school. Maybe he, he barely made it. He barely graduated just because he wears a white gown and he has that, this thing on his wall hanging that he, that he graduated in this university. That makes him you have respect for him. For that you do? God said so. That's enough for me. That's Eima in Yirah. Eima in Yirah means I don't ask questions. I don't have any doubts. This is real. He created the world. He knows what's good for me. We don't know the answers to all the questions. Nobody can make that claim. Nobody knows the answer to all the questions. We, have, we can have an approximate idea of what certain things, why certain things are asur and so forth. But sometimes that's just the best and easiest answer. That shows eima and yira. So that's an important prerequisite from teachers as well. Otherwise the attitude will not be serious. And if the attitude is not serious, how is a person going to acquire Torah? Very simple. Next, Ba'anava, with humbleness, humility. It is very clear from, from what the rabbis tell us in various places in the Gemara, Torah runs away from Gava. Torah runs away from arrogance. The Torah is compared to water. Have you ever seen water flow? Where does it flow to? The lowest place. The Torah, the water flows to the humble. It resides with him. Why? Why is that? Because a humble man is not ashamed to ask questions. He's humble, so he doesn't care. They'll make fun of him, let them make fun of him. So it's very important to ask questions, right? The humble man is more easily inspired. He's more, you can influence him. You can therefore teach him. The guy of Tan says, oh, I already know this. <laughs> I learned it once. Ah, I don't want to hear it again. You see, the arrogance in a person will get him into trouble in many, many respects. So Torah, totally incompatible with Gava, totally, it won't work. Hashem hates people who are arrogant. But humility is, is such a beautiful midah in many ways, but in Torah especially, in order to be able to absorb it, without humility it will be very difficult. The next one is extremely, extremely important, and that's the Simcha. You have to have, what is simcha? People think, oh, simcha means happy. Mm -hmm. Simcha does not only mean happiness, it also means a good mood. Mm -hmm. 
See, you don't have the words good mood here in the Mishnah or in Ashon HaKodesh, even though today we say Matzav Ruach Merumam. He's in an elevated sp spirit. He's in a good mood in Hebrew, modern Hebrew. Besimcha means in a good mood, not just happiness. You're not happy every second. If you're not in a good mood while you're learning, it's going to be difficult. When a person is not in a good mood, he can easily be sad and depressed. And rabbis tell us, the commentaries explain, that what you could learn in one hour being in a good mood, would, you can accomplish a lot more in that one hour than, what it would, than how many hours it will take you if you were depressed. Many, many more hours would be, would, would, would be required to learn the same thing. You know, if one is depressed, many more hours it will take him to learn the same thing that he could learn in one hour. One hour in a good mood, therefore, can, you can accomplish a lot more than seven, eight hours in a bad mood. Being distressed, being down, being upset. So, what should you do if you're in a bad mood? Not learn at all? Why don't you try some vodka? <laughs> 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 or some Persian tea? <laughs> yeah. No, you've got to get out of it. You've got to get out of it. You can't, to learn in a bad mood is not good. It's not effective. It says besimcha. Besimcha means that you will accomplish a lot more. Plus, there are the understanding, the actual learning and understanding of what is being learned will make more sense, will be sharpened as a result of being in a good mood. I can tell you this from experience with caffeine. <laughs> You have a good cup of coffee in the morning, good cup of coffee, not fake coffee, good, strong coffee, it does something to the mind. A good amount of sleep is also very important. Good breakfast is important. And especially in the morning when you're, you're at your best, you want to you be able to have clarity, you, wanna, you want your mind to be as sharp as possible. So in the same way the caffeine the sleep does that, contributes towards a clarity of the mind. The same thing with simcha. Simcha is not only a beautiful midah that, can, that needs to be used in many areas of our life. In learning, it's, it's a, a tremendous important prerequisite. Yeah. What if the, uh, the learning makes you happy? So you're in a bad mood and then you start learning and you become happy? Yeah, you're right. Very good point. The learning can make you happy. But what if you're learning halachot of Tisha Ab? Learn something else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Obviously, at that point, maybe you should turn to something else, the halachot of Purim. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes, that he, you're very right. The Torah mesamacha, the Torah meodedet, the Torah gives us encouragement, the Torah elevates us. And you're definitely right as far as if you want to get an injection of simcha, the Torah can do it for you. But sometimes people are so broken that to get them out of that, that depression, the Torah, the next few minutes of Torah won't do it. it. It requires a lot more. It may take somebody to come and cheer him up. You know, that's how it is. So sometimes we use artificial means to drink or do something, music, yeah. Chew gum, believe it or not, the chewing of the gum, even though you may want to not do it in public, because it looks like you're chewing your cud, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It does something. It does something. It gets certain, I don't know what they're called. Endorphins. Endorphins, yeah. In the mind, it activates certain things, the saliva and all that. It does something. It's a fact. I'm not making it up. It's a fact. You can try it, you'll see it. Same thing with music. It just does something. Good music, not Persian music. You know, not, not <laughs> sad, depressing. You know. the, real, the real nice the wedding music. <laughs> so anyway, Simcha makes a world of a difference in, 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 in many areas of our life and especially in learning. The next one is Let me see here. Hmm. I'm missing here in the Mishnah, Bittahara. Maybe he 
put it later. All right, I don't know why I can't see it here, but the next one is supposed to be the Tahara. Tahara is with purity. Torah is not just something academic, scholastic. You go to college and you learn Torah, you learn uh, some subject matter, you get uh, tested on it, you get a grade, and that's it. You know it or you don't know it. That is, it is possible to learn almost any subject matter if you commit yourself to it, you put your mind to it. Yes, Torah will not really be absorbed properly without purity. Tahara is purity, purity of the mind. Because the Torah is not compatible with materialism and with all that is, uh, that is impure out there. Completely opposite. Purity is against impurities. Very simple. So because impurities stand in the way, because impurities will actually interfere, if a person pursues it a lot, uh, uh, all the materialism and, and all that kind, of, uh, that kind of a lifestyle, it will bother, it will hamper his efforts to learn Torah. So without a pure mind, it will be also difficult for an individual to acquire the Torah. One form of being pure is getting married. That is what the Chachamim encouraged young men to get married as early as possible, so that they should be able to, after the marriage, learn in purity, without having their thoughts wander off in all kinds of directions. So marriage, hopefully a stable marriage, a healthy marriage, will, will promote learning impurity because it would be chaval for a person not to have a clean mind to learn Torah it, ju it just won't work you know, even though he's committed he wants to do it he'll spend hours but he doesn't have a clean mind so purity of the mind is, a, is an important prerequisite the next one is Beshimush Chachamim Shimush Chachamim means assisting Rabbis, at this point in time, beginning with Shimush Chachamim, we're moving to a little bit of a higher level than just plain beginners. The next prerequisites are for those who are a little bit more advanced. You don't have to come onto Shimush Chachamim if you're not going to be very advanced in Torah. You just, you know, want to just learn and know it. You don't have to go onto this level. But this level applies to those who want to advance further. It means to assist rabbis, to learn from them directly from experience. The best way to understand Shimush Chachamim is people who are in the medical field, they have something called internship, they have something called residency. residency. And what happens in those things, in those, at those stages? They learn from the experience of what others are doing around them and perhaps what they are doing in being involved with them too. You're, you're put at the, in the, into the laboratory. You're put with real patients. You're not working on a mannequin anymore. From what I'm told, from what I understand. They're actually given real experience in their field. And I think at that point it becomes more of their specialty too, not just general medicine. So the same thing is with shimush chachamim. There are certain areas in Jewish law that requires shimush. As the rabbi says, gadol shimusha. The, being able to be meshamesh, tamidei chachamim, being able to serve them. As one rabbi said, I only want to be around my teacher just to see how he ties his shoelaces. It was an example of how they do everything. Every detail. They wanted to learn from them the actual practice of what they do, they wanted to see it. Seeing it is much better than just learning it. So they were, they, for they spent time, perhaps years, around Chachamim, especially those who wanted to be judges, they needed to learn from experience how to identify a liar, <laughs> uh, in, in certain halachot of nida, how to recognize certain stains, blood stains, the colorations of them, uh, in all kinds of areas where practice was of, of great importance. Even in Shechita and Trefot, in being able to identify what's not kosher, what's taref. Certain areas of halacha require shimush. Shimush in general of Chachamim, meaning assisting them, being around them, 
seeing them live was a tremendous influence, was a tremendous positive exposure that strengthened one's uh, knowledge of Torah in a, in a very, very good way. So that's what Shibush Chachami means. The next one is Dibuk or, or Dikduk Chaverim, being close to friends or companions who we learn with. Chavruta is a good example. When you have a companion of learning, you're able to ask, you're able to answer, you're able to clarify, you're able to investigate, you're able to look into something. Two heads, as they say in English, are better than one. So that's what Dikdu Chaverim is, being able to, to figure things out in, in, a, in, 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 in a multifaceted way. Instead of us focusing, now we have four eyes looking at it, two minds looking at it. So Dikdu Chaverim helps tremendously to cover uh, or to, to get better insight into a subject matter than we would be able to do it on our own. It's mamash, like that, that's the, the way it really is. Two heads are really better than one. Rabbis speak very much in favor of learning this way, not learning by yourself. Bepilpul atalmidim, if you're in, in the capacity of a teacher, allowing the students to express their own views. Pilpul means an expression of your own insights and your own dissertation of, of how you see something and presenting it in your way. And the rabbis tell us that sometimes the teacher gains so much from his own students, right? As one rabbi said, I learned the most me tamidim. You tell me kulam mi talmidai, he says. The, I, I learned much more from my students than from my teachers, he said. Because by allowing them to share their views, which is the pilpul, the deeper uh, analysis of a subject, all of a sudden, three, four, five, each one saying, oh, oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, that reminds me, there's a question here. So much can be acquired, and you'd be surprised, even sometimes, my father, who was for many years a teacher of young kids, he says, you'd be surprised what these five-year-olds will say when you ask them a question about, why did Sarah do this? Or why did Abraham do this in the Chumash? You'd be surprised at the answers that little kids give, their imagination. So the pilpul of the Talmudim can contribute a lot to a person's learning. Be yeshuv. Yeshuv means yeshuv adat, calm mind. You have to be calm. If you're not calm, some of the times when you're learning something difficult, it will not sink in. You can't rush through it, so you need yeshuv. Yeshuv means you can't rush. You need to be calm. You have to be. You have to have a calm mind. Otherwise, you you miss some details. Bemikra bemishnah, very important point. There are a lot of people that rush to the Kabbalah. Wait a minute. What happened to mikra and mishnah? Mikra is the chumash. Mishnah is the mishnah yod alachod. This is the foundation of Torah. This is the foundation of the Talmud. If you don't know chumash, you don't know mishnah yod. How are you going to go and learn the Gemara? You can't learn geometry or trigonometry or algebra if you didn't learn arithmetic. You've got to learn the basics. That's called bemikra bemishnah. You have to be baki. You have to know that well. Otherwise, you're missing. Missing an important area of learning that there'll, there'll always be a gap there. It, it won't make sense to learn higher level of learning without learning the basics. Basics is therefore Mikra and Mishnah. The next one is Mi'ut Shena. Looks like he's skipping here. He may have a different version here. I'm going to go by my version. The Mi'ut Shora. I'm going to go by the other version. Mi'utz chora means with little business. You can't, a person who's involved 12 hours a day in his business, he has to sleep, he has to eat, he has to pray. When is he going to learn? A person wants to succeed in his learning. He wants to remember the crown of Torah. There has to be mi'utz chora, a little bit, or minimize. He should minimize his business hours, his amount of hours that he works. 
That's very nice. A lot of people learn a half an hour a day. You want to get the Torah, it's, it won't be enough. The greatest leaders of our, of our time and of all the generations in the past were completely devoted to Torah. That's how they became giants in Torah, the crown of Torah. Mi'utz Chorah. They didn't spend all day long in, in business. The next one is Bimi'ut Derecheretz and Bimi'ut Ta'anug. Derecheretz and Ta'anug are somewhat similar. They involve all kinds of pinukim, as I would call them in Hebrew, all kinds of things that spoil us, all kinds of activities in life that are for leisure. Derecheretz is all kinds of uh, things that preoccupy us. I'll give you examples. Let's say tonight you have a commitment. Somebody, a friend of yours is having a barbecue. Why? His girl is becoming, is turning a bat mitzvah. Right? You feel committed. You say, well, should I go, should I not go? I have a shiur, I want to learn. Tomorrow you have a wedding. The following night you have sheva brachot. The following day you have a doctor's appointment. The following day you have to go take your car to the mechanic. All of these commitments, some of them are necessary, some of them are not so necessary. That's called derecheretz. That's one interpretation of the word derecheretz. There's other, another interpretation that involves one's commitment uh, to his wife, which of course, you know, one has to be committed and uh, do uh, his share in the marriage. But it has to be me'ot. You have to minimize it. You can't be too, too much involved in all these things because the same thing with ta'anugot. What's ta'anug? You want to go on vacation. That's ta'anug. That's pleasure. It doesn't say asur. It says mi'ut. I want to take a four-week cruise. Four-week cruise? You know what's that going to do to your minyan, to your shiurim? Unless on the, on the, on the boat they have minyanim and their shiurim, okay, maybe. It's going to ruin it. Can you do it? Yeah, you take a few days off. You're allowed to have some tanu, you're allowed to take a break, you're allowed to change scenery. It's actually healthy. But it says mi'ut, if you want the crown of Torah. So mi'ut, derecheretz, mi'ut tanu, otherwise all of these meetings and all of these commitments to people, and again to eat, and again to watch, and hello, chube, and yeah, come on. <laughs> come on, you know, before you know it, your, 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 your time is gone. You don't have time for all these things. You come, hello, nice, mazal tov, and you leave. That's, that's the only thing you could do. Yeah. Next one is mi'ut shena. How much should you sleep? The Rambam says eight hours is standard. The older you get, the less you need. All I can tell you is I try. I, and uh, under five hours for me is very difficult. Five hours, I can still survive the next day, but it's not easy. Under five hours is very, very unhealthy, and you have to take a nap. And if you, if you don't have the time to take a nap, that means you've deprived yourself of the sleep that you cannot make up. Shana is important. As we said before, you have to have a good amount of sleep, but don't exaggerate it. Seven hours, I think, for most of us is enough, more than enough. But what if you want to have your siesta, right? Besides the seven hours, I know. Chaval, you're wasting the time. So mi'ut shena, it has to be that you were willing to give up some of the sleep. Sleep less. Then mi'ut sicha and mi'ut chok, talk less. People who talk long, long, long on the phone, especially in the days when, the, when every phone call costs money, today you can get away with it. You can talk unlimited, they say. <laughs> Everybody likes unlimited. But mi'ut sicha, I may have told you last week or a couple of weeks ago the famous story with the Gaon of Vilna. He hadn't seen his sister for 50 years. You know, they all went living far away from each other, got married. Finally, she came to his town. She was so excited. Imagine a sister to see her brother, big Tamit Chacham, big Gaon, Gaon of Vilna. And he came out to greet her and said, Hi, how are things? Nice to see you. And after that, she wanted to continue to talk and says, my dear sister, I, I really love you very, very much, and it's been a long time, but you can see the white hair on my beard. This is a signal from Shemaim that the days are coming very soon. I have to go back upstairs, and, you know, I can't waste my time. So 
I think I remember the story, the, the, another version of the story says, we'll continue upstairs or <laughs> something like that. You know, there's no time to really talk more about what. What are you going to say? Well, you know, I have four kids and five grandkids and this is. And with all this siha, you, you don't achieve anything. That's what mi'ut siha means. You want to achieve Torah, it has to be mi'ut. You have to minimize it. Mi'ut schok. Schok is laughter. Laughter is sometimes good. The rabbis used to crack a joke before they started the, the class. A nice joke. Just to get everybody awake. Just to get everybody excited. Just to get everybody in the right mood. But after that, they got into business. Laughter, humor is sometimes good because it energizes us. It uplifts us. It stimulates us. But mi'ot. Just a bare minimum. Because you have to be serious. Serious about life. Serious about the, how to manage our time. But those who watch comedies all the time, it, it becomes dangerous stuff. Too much schok can lead to all kinds of uh, sinful ways, believe it or not. It's, it's, not too, it's not good. You have to be serious. Next one is the Erech with tolerance. The, both the teacher and the student have to be tolerant. Why? Because sometimes when, you, when things do not go the, you, the way you want it, you may give up quickly, you didn't understand it. Mit yashim. No, be tolerant. Persistent. And tolerant and patient because sometimes things require more than one time learning and requires a review. If you're not tolerant, you can easily make a mistake. If you're not tolerant, you can easily become angry. Tolerance is very, very important to mitah in general. To be tolerant of people's faults. Imagine if you're a teacher and the student is making mistakes. So in order to succeed in the learning, it's important to have the patience, the tolerance, to deal with all kinds of issues that come up. Finally, we have the, the, the last midah for tonight is belef tov. You have to have a good heart. What's a good heart? A good heart is a kind individual, a person who's generous. A person who's kind and good, can, it helps him concentrate. The rabbis tell us a person who's not kind will have a hard time concentrating because either he's jealous, <laughs> he's not kind, either he's upset at somebody who's doing a better job explaining the, the course, the shi'ur, than he is. You see? He's not kind, he's not generous. Azulome fargen. He's unhappy about other people who are doing better than him. He's jealous. Therefore, a kind-spirited person, a generous person, helps with his concentration. He's happy that other people are doing better. He's, let them succeed. Let them open up more kolalim in yeshivot. He has the right positive attitude. He's a left tov. He's not bothered by all these trivialities that other people would who do not have a left tov. That's why a good heart is, is so special in many areas of, of the mitzvot, but in learning Torah too. It helps concentrate. It helps a person focus on the learning and not be bothered by silly things. People are bothered by all kinds of silly things because they, they, they don't have a good, generous heart. If you're generous, tamifargen, you, you are happy for others. You don't have chesh tang, right? <laughs> you know, no. you're not narrow in, in, your, in your how you see it. You, you know, other people being successful, you, you're kind to them. And uh, with such a disposition, a person can definitely do much better in his learning. Just to finish up, we'll continue next week, B'zat Hashem, from the panic where we left off. But to finish off, the rabbis do tell us that if a person sees that he's having a hard time in his learning, instead of asking God in his prayers, God, please, make it so that all this Torah will be absorbed into me, that it should enter me, and that it should stay with me. Instead of praying and asking for that, it is much more correct to pray Hashem, make it that all the goodies in life should not enter me. Not all the pinukim should enter my system. You know, I shouldn't covet and I shouldn't desire all these things that people desire because they are the ones that are interfering. So if a, because if a person covets, wants all the pinukim, all the pleasures of life, all the goodies, all the foods and all the snacks and an ice cream cone and this, and all this, this is pinukim. If you covet and you have a habit of eating a lot and snacking, it's going to interfere with the Torah. There's no room for both. So instead of asking for the Torah to enter, ask somehow to get help to leave those stuff out so that they should not interfere. The Rambam tells us that it, it, it makes a big difference what's in your head. 
אין, 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 אין היצר הרע של עריות מתגברת, אלא בלב הפנוי מחוכמה, he says. The Rambam says, one's heart and mind is not subject to the powers of the evil inclination in forbidden, you know, relationships and so forth. His mind does not get involved in that, and he's not exposed to that. He doesn't think about those things, unless his mind is completely devoid and empty of Torah. Well, if the mind is empty, it's going to absorb a lot of stuff from the street, a lot of things he's going to see, he's going to watch. The mind cannot be left empty, and it can definitely cannot be filled with all the things that, that, that disturb the Torah. The best cure, and the best way for a person to stay away from sin too, is to fill his mind with chokhmah, chokhmat of Torah. Keep yourself busy with chokhmah, absorb Torah, In this way, you leave out, you don't leave room for the Yetzirah to think about other things. Once a person is idle and not busy and he thinks, his mind wanders and fascinates about all kinds of things. That's the human imagination. And the Yetzirah then has a, an opening to get in. Especially if he saw a movie. Oh, that's even worse. Then he opened the door. A person who sees things that are not right in the internet, goes to movies, or reads books that are pornographic in nature, and he's asking for trouble because he's letting the Yetzirah into his door for free. You, the only way to leave it out is not only to not watch these things, but to immerse oneself in Torah. The Torah will also give him the strength to fight off the Yetzirah. The Torah, will, like you said before, will gladden him, will uplift his spirits, will guide him in life, will give him direction, clarity of the mind, improve his attitude. There's so many benefits that we haven't discussed of what the Torah does. Here we're just talking about prerequisites of acquiring Torah. And obviously it's important that a person do the right things, otherwise, you know, there's going to be a lot of competition from the Yetzirah. A lot of competition out there to invade our mind. Try this gadget out. The latest iPhone is out. The latest smartphone, the latest, I don't even know what they're called. The latest uh, iPad, the latest this, you know. Oh, and what do they do? They stay out in the street and sleep overnight so they can get the best deal. The first Be the first one in there. With this kind of attitude, you think that's going to go with Torah? No way in the world. It's so opposite. All of this gashmiut, this homer, this materialism is so not compatible with Torah. And that's why the Rambam says, and the rabbis tell us, got to, we got to fill our minds with healthy Torah, and that will help us leave out the rest of the stuff. Otherwise, there's a vacuum there, and it's going to be filled. The vacuum is going to be filled by something. If that's the case, it's going to be filled. Let us better fill it with Torah. And by filling it with Torah, Bezat Hashem, we will also be able to grow and elevate ourselves step by step until Bezat Hashem, we acquire the crown of Torah. Amen.